It's crypto summer, which means it's festival season. At Real Vision, we're getting ready for the next festival of learning in partnership with Kraken. It's taking place April 18 and 19, and the theme is don't F up alts, memes, and NFTs. Yep, there's a big world of digital assets beyond Bitcoin and ETH with lots of opportunity and lots of risk. We'll be bringing a ton of timely and actionable knowledge from speakers including Rao Pal, Sergio Silva, Kevin Kelly, OSF, and more. It's completely free to attend. Just go to realvision.com slash festival of learning to get the details and save your seat. We'll see you there. What geopolitical risks are not priced in? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today, Marco Pavich, partner and chief strategist at the Clock Tower Group, and Jacob Shapiro, director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Hello to both of you. Great to be here. Hi, Maggie. Thanks we, for having me back on. We get the dream team. So we wanted to uh, begin and end the day with a conversation about geopolitics because we not only, of course, had Iran launch a direct military attack on Israel over the weekend, but we are also just over six months away from a U.S. election um, that are that's going to have huge implications um, and a lot of drama probably surrounding it. So we thought it was a good opportunity to just sort of gather ourselves and talk about both of those events and everything in between, um, because there's going to be there's a there's a lot of intersection with with the global economy and with markets. Uh, because of that. So Jacob, let's start with you, because we talked a bit with Marco earlier in the day, and you could all see that interview on the platform. But what, if anything, as you think about what happened over the weekend, what, if anything, do you think has changed as a result of Iran's actions? Well, first of all, Marco and I need to decide who's who on the dream team, because I'll, I'll claim the Larry Bird role, but I don't know which role he's going to claim. Maybe he's the <laughs> Charles Barkley character. I'm not quite sure, but we can talk about that later. Um, I think I'm probably going to agree with Marco in some of the particulars, but I'll try and, and paint a view of, of why I think it's important, not necessarily what has changed. Um, I think Iran was showing off capabilities to Israel. I think that's also why they telegraphed that they were attacking to the United States and everybody else. Um, and I think that part of that was to show Israel, look, we can mess you up if we want to. We can shut down your economy. Um, next time, we won't tell the United States we're coming. So you won't have the support of U.S. destroyers and all these other assets that help you shoot them, shoot these things out of the sky. They also targeted Israeli bases. So they're telling Israel right there, we know where some of the bases are. We know where to hit. Um, but I think the broader thing to think about is Iran has actually been very smart and strategic about this conflict from the beginning. Start with the Houthis as a proxy in the Red Sea and stopping shipping in the Red Sea. That's about telling the United States, look, we are going to increase the costs for you to have to intervene. Um, in doing this with Israel, they didn't actually do anything, but they signaled, look, there are going to be increased costs if you, if you decide to do these things. Um, I also think that Iran learned something very important, which is they can telegraph a meaningless attack a week ahead of time, and they can get the United States military to freak out and allocate resources to defending Israel, which strategically in the grand scheme of things is not very important. Um, to the United States. That's a wonderful switch to know that you have if you're Russia, which is a partner of Iran, or if you're China, which is a partner of Iran. If you can say, hey, Iran, flip the switch because we're going to mess around over here in Ukraine, or we're going to mess around over here in the South China Sea or, or somewhere else in the world. Um, so I've seen a lot of victory laps from Israeli media, from Western media about, oh, the, the much vaunted missile defense and Israel did great and things like that. I think Iran, everything is going exactly the way Iran wants right now. And I find this complacency and this sort of smug self-satisfaction that they were able to shoot probably Iran's worst missiles out of the sky one time when they telegraphed the attack kind of strange. And the last thing I'll just say is that this is what a multipolar world looks like. It's not US-China Cold War. It's going to be all these brush fires all over the place. And we're seeing that the Middle East is sort of the center of multipolarity right now. You started the segment with, you know, what are the geopolitical risks that are not priced in? I want to know what the geopolitical opportunities are that are not priced in. Mm. And it's those that are as far away from the Middle East as you can get. This makes me want to go hunting for bargains in Brazil. It makes me want to find out what's going on in Indonesia. It makes me super interested in Argentina and Mexico. The places that are not at the epicenter of all these things happening, I think that's where the real opportunity is in all of this, because the Middle East just looks like even more of a dumpster fire than it has been for the last few decades. Yeah, that, that's that's super interesting. I, I want to go back to that because all of those places, while very interesting, um, we know if the world gets embroiled in something, 
it's very hard for anyone to do well. I don't know if that you think that's changed, but but we'll tackle that. But Marco, I want you to respond to that um, because, and I, you know, wh- whether they really think they th- that it went as well as possible, I think you've got to ignore a lot of political rhetoric, right? It's directed at a domestic audience to say how great we are and and coming from talking heads behind the scenes, we don't really know whether they actually are that complacent or not. One would hope not because it's not hard for most of us watching it to figure out that that was pretty smooth operation. But Marco, what about this? I, I think the, the the inherent question, what Jacob said, is the U.S. stretched too thin? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think the U.S. is stretched thin. The U.S. is what it is, and the world is what it is. And so here's where I agree completely with Jacob. I mean, the world is just a multipolar world. And a lot of Americans, you know, don't like when you say that because it suggests America is no longer number one. And I mean, it is. The U.S. is still materially the most powerful country in the world. But in order for the world to be unipolar or even bipolar, you know, the U.S. really needs to be head and shoulder and torso and hip above everyone else. It can't just be head and shoulder above everyone else. And that's the world we're, where we're in. And so, you know, there's going to be more of these, as Jacob calls them, brush fires. Um, some of them are going to be more significant than others. And uh, there's really nothing that the U.S could do to prevent this from happening, including, and I think this is the most important thing, it couldn't prevent Israel from provoking Iran into this attack. I think that's like the most important thing that no one's really talking about today, Mm. uh, because it's not nice to bring it up in polite society, but like Israel did attack an embassy of Iran. There's no consulates, by the way, in capital cities. That was an embassy of Iran in Damascus and just blew it up and killed a bunch of Iranian officials in it. You know, so like, what did we expect Iran to do? Well, some sort of retaliation for attacking its sovereign territory. And that's a great example of something that wouldn't have happened during the Cold War. Mm. Your ally would not go out and scuttle the president's re-election chances. It wouldn't do something to upset your own geopolitical imperatives because, you know, there would be repercussions to it. And I think that's the big Point here. And, in, and, you know, to answer your question, what has changed? I would say what's changed is that Israel has managed quite successfully to flip the script, the PR narrative of Israel being an aggressor to not being a victim. And I think that that's um, a pretty, pretty uh, great example of how Netanyahu is a really good strategist and a tactician, and that he's probably going to use it over the next couple of weeks to, you know, wrap up the situation in Gaza probably quite brutally. Uh, and that's going to be the cost, potentially, of Israeli acquiescence to not expanding this conflict further. Hmm. Jacob, your your thoughts on that? And Paul is responding. Did he just say Israel is not strategically important to the U.S.? This is one of those, like, you know, conversations when you're talking about Israeli-U.S. relationships. It's it's very uh, people feel very passionately on both sides. But, you know, there's there's the rhetoric and then there's a changing dynamic, I suppose. Jacob, how are you seeing that? Uh, yes, I'm saying that it's not strategically important to the U.S. I'll do you one better. The Middle East is not strategically important to the United States. It hasn't been since the shale revolution. We no longer have to import any, any energy from this part of the world. You know who it's strategically important for? China, Japan, India, South Korea, the countries that are actually now dependent on importing from this part of the world. I am looking forward to watching the movie where China and India have to be responsible for political stability in the Middle East and not the United States. I really do think it's an anachronism. Um, the the U.S.-Israel relationship goes back to the height of the Cold War, where the Arab countries were signing up with the Soviet Union or lining up with the Soviet Union, and Israel was seen as one of the allies of the United States in that conflict. If you go back pre-67, so from roughly 1948 to 1967, the United States was actually not on Israel's side. It was the United States that told Israel after the Sinai, the Sinai campaign in 56, go home, you're not allowed to do this. The only reason that Israel has nuclear weapons is because the French um, gave them nuclear technology in the period beforehand. The only reason they won in 48 was because Czechoslovakia, via the Soviet Union, was shuttling black market weapons there. So yes, I'm saying that Israel is not that strategically important to the United States. I will differ with Marco in the sense that I think he's right that Bibi is an absolutely brilliant tactician. I think he's a measly strategist. Uh, And I think that Israel in the long term is looking at some very difficult challenges that it can't overcome. And it's not because of anything external. There's a reason that Jewish polities in this part of the world don't last very long, why there's very few times in history where you have independent Jewish states in the heart of the Middle East. And it's usually because the Jewish states start fighting with themselves. 
the Assyrians and the Babylonians only took over the ancient Israelites after the, the Davidic monarchy split in two and they were all fighting each other. The last thing I just want to say is the country that nobody is talking about in the Middle East right now, but which is quietly just playing all sides, you know, criticizing Israel on the one side, uh, watching Iran do what it's going to do, cleaning up stuff in Iraq with its own interests on the same day that the attack happened. And that's Turkey. Like mm. Turkey is sitting there, the most advanced economy in the region. Like I said, on the same day that all these attacks were happening, they bombed some more Kurdish sites in northern Iraq. They've been uh, increasing their operations there in the last month, um, playing all sides of the Russia-Ukraine war, playing all sides with China. Like they are the ones that are quietly sitting there. And if Bibi was really a brilliant strategist, he would recognize that in the long run, it's Turkey, not Iran, which is an existential threat to Israel's existence from an external perspective. It, like, just think about the attack that Iran authored here. It's a bunch of drones and missiles that took hours to get there because they're so far away from each other. Iranian and Israeli fighter jets can't even fight each other in a top gun type battle because they don't have the refueling capacity or the bases to actually punch each other. It's like one of those basketball fights or hockey fights where nobody's actually punching and the guy's just saying, hold me back. Like, I'm really going to get the little Satan and back and forth. Uh, Turkey's right next door. So a brilliant Israeli strategist, I think, would recognize, number one, Israeli society's coming apart at the seams, that the society, uh, the society has been militarized now for months because of the post-traumatic stress disorder that's coming from those awful attacks on October 7th, and that the biggest looming enemy on a sort of span of decades is sitting there biding its time. So, mm. Marco, um, your thoughts on Turkey, and does this usher in a change of leadership? Uh, and, and does Netanyahu do something because his back is up against the wall in this divided society that Jacob just described? You know, I'm going to let Mr. Shapiro fall in that landmine you know, and drop us some of that Hebrew school uh, wisdom about Assyrians. I'm just going to like gently slide to the side of that. And um, yeah, I mean, I agree everything Jacob is uh, talking about. I mean, it's difficult to be a brilliant strategist when, you know, you have domestic constraints. And I think Jacob has articulated them very well. I mean, it's difficult to, you know, tone down the military operation in Gaza, no matter what you think about it. Uh, when, you know, like you have two ultra-Orthodox, very conservative parties um, holding the coalition, you know, hostage to some of their views. So that's all correct. And I think, uh, I think that what's just happened does give uh, the government in Israel more maneuverability, because at least uh, globally, some of the uh, rhetoric that was that Israel is an aggressor is now uh, you're literally shoved further down the web page, you know, because what's front and center is um, the Iranian attack. Um, you know, to me, the other country that I'm actually really interested in here is Saudi Arabia, which has managed to uh, kind of do the same thing that Turkey has done. Um, and again, it hasn't really, this is something that I mentioned this morning, Maggie, that I think is very important for investors. The reason that there hasn't really been a geopolitical risk premium that many kind of geopolitical tourists would have expected in oil prices is that none of the Iranian proxies are actually targeting the energy facilities in the Gulf in any way, shape, or form. And they were. They were doing so in 2022. They were doing so in 2019. All the Houthi attacks are basically targeting your toys, T-shirts, and toaster ovens, you know, being carried by container ships through the Red Sea. Nobody cares about that. Uh, it doesn't have a major impact on the economy. Like, we can, we can deal with that. If those same drones were targeting tankers in the Gulf or Saudi facilities, as they had in the past, we would be in a different situation. And I think that What's interesting to me, and where I do differ from Jacob, is that I think actually Middle East is a source of immense opportunities going forward. And that's because Israel-Iranian conflict, which is now fully in the open, has not impacted global supply and hasn't impacted a lot of the Sunni monarchies that have effectively made a deal with Iran uh, for whatever it's worth. Um, they're focused on economic development, and that's good. Conflict in of itself, being proximate geographically to a certain like equity market shouldn't be a reason you don't invest in it. I mean, some of the most lucrative markets in the 50s and the 60s were actually Western European economies that were rebuilding after World War II. So, you know, mm. uh, France, Western Germany, uh, actually Franco Spain was one of the best equity markets in terms of performance throughout the 60s in the world. And they were obviously proximate to the eventual battlefield of eventual World War III as the Soviet tank divisions burst through the Fulda Gap in some theoretical attack on, on NATO, like those were the equity markets that actually did well, in part because they were relevant to global players, many of them, including the US, 
because of their proximity to this you know potential zone of fissure. So yeah, I, I don't I don't worry about investing in in places that are close to conflict as long as there is a sustainable you know equilibrium. And I think the fact that the U.S. has withdrawn from the Middle East is why there is a sustainable equilibrium. As long as that equilibrium was being imposed by the U.S., it was under risk of the U.S. just withdrawing. And that's what we saw in 2011 to 2016 with the rise of Islamic State, with almost fall of Baghdad and eventually Riyadh to a bunch of lunatics, which could, which could have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't happen. And one of the reasons is that there is a, somewhat of an equilibrium between the Sunnis and the Shias. And I actually think that that's a, a very welcome development for the future of the Middle East. That's so interesting. Is there a power broker now in the it, it, with the U.S. Um, as Jacob laid out, perhaps not with the interest? Although we did have a question: What about intelligence? Is there no intelligence value? But if the U.S. is withdrawing from the Middle East, is there a de facto power broker? Is it Turkey? Is it Saudi Arabia? Are we likely to see everyone pursuing their own interests and this kind of equilibrium you talk about, Marco? Jacob, you first. Well, I wanted to jump in and say, well, first of all, Marco, I don't know how you knew. Greenfield Hebrew Academy, class of 2002. Uh, Wild guess, makes, man. You know, the, the, Wild second guess. Most, the second most famous graduate of the Greenfield Hebrew Academy. Harris Barton, the all-pro San Francisco 49ers uh, offensive guard who protected Joe Montana, also went to my dear elementary school alma mater. But shout out to G.H. Shea. I doubt anybody from that school has any idea that I'm well, on you'd be surprised. <laughs> I'd be surprised. All right. Well, great. Well, get at me. You know where to find me. Um, look, I, I I disagree with Marco on the Middle East. And it in part is the answer to your question, Maggie, is, which is exactly why I'm not afraid of conflict. Uh, and I think, for instance, the Ukraine war uh, makes certain sort of military industrial opportunities in Western and Eastern Europe absolutely wonderful. There's a lovely risk reward there. And a lot of the market is pricing in bad demographics or the Russia, you know, uh, lack of um, access to natural gas because of Russia and things like that. Whereas I see countries like the Czech Republic, Denmark, even France, maybe eventually Germany will get on board too. I mean, revving up the machine in a way that they haven't done in literally decades. And one of the reasons that they can do that is because Europe has mature states with sophisticated bureaucracies, with institutions and the rule of law and all these other things. And the thing that the Middle East does not have is any of the things I just talked about. Separating Iran and and Israel is some de facto states, which are really a bunch of, some of them are crony thuggish regimes that are holding on to, to some territory like the Assad regime. ISIS is still hanging out there. You've got jihadist proxies all over the place. You've got the Houthis, which are just one proxy among many in Yemen. These Gulf monarchies that we're talking about, yes, they have lots of oil and natural gas. Yes, Saudi Arabia even looks like it's been producing more uh, out of its economy than just oil. I think it was what, half of the economy now is coming from non-oil sources, or at least that's what they're bragging about. Um, But this is not a society that has shown us that they have any sort of meaningful sense of nationalism, let alone a political class or a bureaucratic class that is sort of built for the modern world. So I I fully admit that there there's opportunity everywhere. And mm. the sort of, you know, the higher the risk, maybe the greater your reward. But I see just as juicy, if not juicier opportunities in place around conflicts like in Western Europe and Eastern Europe with the Russia-Ukraine war, maybe Brazil in the context of Venezuela burying its teeth around Guyana. Like, I'm not afraid of conflict. I'm afraid of these sort of very feeble weak states which have been talking about how they're going to modernize for decades and haven't because they're stuck in the past and because you know they're also bearing the scars of colonialism and everything else Mm. um i'm good i want to keep it moving if that's the right marco but you can you can go back and follow up if you want um jeffrey asked this this morning and asking again jeffrey so I'm, i'm going to pose it and it's a really interesting link in here in terms of thinking uh would you argue that u.s aiding israel is in retaliating would actually help their election strategy to be able to ignore CPI and thus lower rates. Win-win, Biden looks strong and rates go down. Um, how does the Israel situation feed into the U.S. election? There's, there's an, I think there's some faulty thinking in terms of the CPI and rates going down, but we'll, we'll tackle that part in a second, but let's stick to the first part in terms of potentially how this feeds into a U.S. election. Uh, Marco. Yeah, so, I mean, look, um, here's a chart I'm going to share with you guys. This is uh, different presidents at this point in their term. So the purple one is uh, President Biden. The gray ones are uh, basically every single president who was running for re-election since World War II. Uh, As you can see, Biden is at this point the least popular president 
at this point in their presidency ahead of the re-election. Um, it looks like he's going to run into some of the other ones that were less popular um, as they came closer. But the point is, he's not doing great. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you could make a case that on some level, you know, President Biden could ha- be helped by um, a firm, aggressive um, foreign policy move. The problem with that is that that's not what this particular American median voter cares about. This is an American median voter that, to use, you know, Jacob's term about Israelis post-October 7th, uh, this is an American median vo- voter that really has PTSD about foreign entanglements, particularly in the Middle East. Um, if you look at the polling in terms of uh, what country Americans consider the greatest threat, is Iran has completely collapsed, even though their uh, enrichment um, has increased. Most Americans just don't care. And so I would say that it would probably be a political mistake for Biden to focus on this issue right now, because, yeah, Americans just really don't want another entanglement in the Middle East. So that's number one. Number two, on the CPI, I think Israel just handed, and Iran, handed the Fed the excuse to ignore CPI. In other words, as I discussed this morning, perhaps the most important macro implication of what just happened is that there was a concern. I mean, again, on Friday, the number one reason the market has been coming down uh, over the past uh, two weeks, since we reached 5,200 on S&P 500, the number one reason is this debate within the macro community on whether or not the Fed is going to have to adjust their expectation of three cuts. And the number one reason for that is the stickiness of inflation. Well, you just handed Jay Powell the excuse for why he can look through any stickiness. He can just simply say it's transitory, it's a product of exogenous geopolitical factors we do not control, and we're not about to cause more pain and headwinds to the U.S. economy because the uh, regime in Iran is increasing the geopolitical risk premium to oil prices. I can see him literally saying verbatim those words in the next press conference as he cut rates. So, Jeffrey, the... Um, it, 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 yes, but not for the reasons you thought, I think, is the answer. It's not because it would make Biden look strong. It would be because the Fed would have the cover, in, in Marco's opinion, to be able to cut rates. Jacob, I want to bring up another issue about that, though. And this is something that you raised in your conversation with D. Smith um, in March when we were last talking geopolitics. But it came up again in a conversation I had with Vincent Delaward from Stonex yesterday when it comes to inflation and the election. Let's have a listen to that and we'll talk on the other side. You know, Trump, Trump has many, you know, um, uh, changed his views many, many times on many topics, but one area that, I, uh, two areas that I think he's really kind of part of core Trumpism is one is protectionism. I mean, if you, if you look at videos of him from the early eighties, he was always talking about like the Japanese stealing our job. And then, so I think truly, truly he believes uh, you know, that the, the, the trade deficit is something that needs to be cut that, you know, so he, that, that part, I think is going to be really like maybe transactional his approach, uh, you know, he may, you know, pick on certain countries to save some others, but overall, uh, you know, he, he threatened a 60% tariff on Chinese export and 10% across the board. Can you imagine that? I mean, the shock, like if, if we do see that, I mean, it's, it's going to be huge. Uh, and then the second part that, you know, Trump is, you know, I think consistent about is, you know, he's, he's, He's a re- New York real estate guy. Like he's made money with leverage. I mean, he's he's a dead guy. He he wants uh, low rates, low rates, more debt, and and, and juice it up. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, a Trump uh, election a victory would be extremely bullish for for inflation. I think this is such an important point. And Jacob, when you said it in mid March, it really struck me because there was not a lot of conversation around that. And when you're looking at polls um, um, among American voters, Marco, to your point, foreign policy almost never matters. It's almost always a pocketbook issue for Americans and the economy. And this time around, it's really inflation. Um, there's some polls that show that people thought they were better off four years ago when Trump, forgetting about COVID and all that, than now. That inflation issue is such so front and center on people's minds. And Jacob, um, what Vincent just said about it being super inflationary, a Trump win, it seems like either candidate, there's a there's a risk of that. How do you see that inflation piece of the puzzle? 
Yeah, well, let's break a, a couple of things apart. First of all, I, I disagree with Marco on the rate cuts. And Marco, I have dispatched numerous drones that are going to drop leaflets all over your office explaining this position to you. So you have time to position whatever things you need to appropriately. I also, I just want to quote my, I, I believe it was my fellow Louisianian, James Carville, who said when Clinton was running that it's the economy stupid. Exactly. It's always the economy stupid. Like that's always where things are going to end up. Bob Rubin had some it's... choice words about bond traders too, to Clinton. <laughs> um, but look, Look, I, I was one of the first people talking about this. I've been thinking and worrying about Trump ter uh, tariff policy for quite some time. Super inflationary? I don't know what that means. Uh, so maybe it's 10% on all imports from other countries, because that's the tariff rate that he's talking about. Maybe it's 60% from China. I don't know if that's super. I don't know if that qualifies as super. And there's all sorts of things in there. I think the key point about inflation that people need to have in their minds, and we're not used to thinking about it this way, is that it's going to be volatile. It's going to spike up and down. And I actually did some research on this recently. If you go back to August 1955 and look at the CPI every single month, not year, every single month to March 2009 increases every single month. So there is an multiple generations of Americans who are just used to prices going up and to the right. You get a little bit of a seesaw around the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, and still it's up and to the right. It takes off in 2016. So we've sort of been conditioned to think that inflation is only going in one direction. Um, if you look back to the world 1913 to 1941, CPI increased maybe 18 times during that time period, decreased 10 times. So it's this back and forth sort of topsy-turvy type of world. And that's what I think we're getting to. And the reason I give you that data is because if Trump gets elected, there's a couple different scenarios there, and I'm not going to even try. I don't have the hubris to predict what Trump is going to do. For all I know, these are negotiation tactics, and he doesn't mean any of it. But let's say that he does it. Let's say that he raises these tariffs significantly and you get an inflationary spike. And let's say Jay Powell says, okay, we're going to have to raise rates because we have to contain this inflation. What if by doing so, you get so much demand destruction and so much of a shock to the economy? And this is what happened in the, in the early 1930s is you go from massive inflation to massive deflation. And suddenly we're not talking about an inflationary crisis at all. We're talking about the fact that, huh, in 2023, global trade shrunk by 5% and trade, and trade volumes were roughly stagnant. Maybe that was the beginning of something. Maybe we're going to see trade volumes continue to decline. Maybe we're going, maybe Chinese deflation is finally going to get exported to the rest of the market. And then we're in a whole completely different set of variables than let's say he hikes tariffs, the Fed does nothing. Then you get more inflation, but maybe you get more growth on top of it. Or um, as I said before, let's say it's all a negotiating tactic and we're not worrying about inflation at all. So a lot of this comes down to can we figure out what Trump actually means and what he's going to do when he's going to get in office? I don't know. And so I spend most of my time right now when I'm doing geopolitical risk, when I'm not being distracted by the Iranians and their silly drones and this like cat fight in the Middle East with which of these scenarios is right. Can I get myself in the head of this Trump character and which direction it's going to go? What if it's Biden at the same time? There is so much uncertainty and volatility around that, that I, I really do think that's the center of gravity to be thinking about. And Marco, is there any scenario where it seems like there's fiscal restraint in Washington, regardless of who wins? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, on the on the drones carrying leaflets, I mean, what I would say to Jacob, it's like, it doesn't really matter. I think too many people focus on how many cuts are going to happen. Look, the truth is, they shouldn't have been talking about cuts anyways. That's what matters. That's why the market is up as much as it is, because the Fed is behind the curve relative to the macro context. I think too many investors focus on the number of cuts. And the fact that the market went down as cuts are being priced out is also silly. You know, like, I mean, they should be probably hiking, quite frankly. So this is all kind of banal. The point is the Fed is behind a curve and is behind a curve for political reasons. And that's going to be the case until the election. After the election, we were presented with this scenario of Trump, is he inflationary, is he deflationary? Um, I think it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, I'm in the camp that believes that he is not really going to increase tariffs as much as he does. They are negotiating tools, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter. Look, the, uh, pricing tariffs and their inflationary impact is so difficult because on one hand, yes, you're raising prices, literally. On the other hand, the dollar strengthens, which offsets those price increases because it's imported goods. So, you know, good luck, like sort of doing the quantitative analysis on that. To me, what really matters is that, you know, James Carville said another thing. And he said that when he dies, he doesn't want to get reincarnated as a ball player or an actor. He wants to be reincarnated as the bond market because everyone's afraid of the bond market. And that, of course, refers to the 1994 bond market riot. Um, you know, Bill Clinton actually didn't run as a third-way centrist. He ran as an Arkansas um, populist. 
he wanted to basically give back the war dividend from the Cold War to the people, and the bond market rioted, forcing him to sit down with Newt Gingrich. And I think we're setting up the stage for the same thing. Whether Trump initiates uh, tariffs or not, I think that the bond market will riot if President Trump wins. Why? Well, because he's likely going to win and keep the Senate, sorry, flip the Senate and keep the House. I think that's the you know, highest mathematical probability. I don't want to really get into it because it doesn't matter. It just is. And then you're going to have this kind of a scenario, which we had from 2016 to 2018, where the bond yields basically went from Brexit at one and a half to 3% when President Trump lost the domestic prerogative by losing the midterms. Now, nobody remembers about this. You know, nobody remembers this move because we all remember those futures going down on the election day and then going back up. And that's because bonds and equities at the time were negatively correlated, in part because we needed growth. We needed inflation. You know, Donald Trump was God's retribution for austerity. He was the mean reversion fairy, if you will. And this time around, we're not starting at one and a half. As you said this morning, Maggie, quite, uh, quite correctly, by the way, the market heard you and went down. Uh, we're starting at 4.6. If we have another one of these moves, um, you know, there's no way, there's no chance in hell that the equity market is going to do well when Trump gets elected. And it's not about tariffs. It's not about protectionism. It's not about foreign policy. It's because he's ultimately a economic populist. He's targeting nominal GDP growth. That's what the world needed in 2016. It's not what the world needs in 2024. And so when bonds sell off this time, it won't be for 175 level, it will be for 460 level. And that will have negative implications for equities. And I think that's what the market should be concerned about. But it can't price it in because the betting markets are evenly split. And so this could be that shock on November 6th that catches a lot of people by surprise. Um, UBS out today saying there's a risk Fed hikes, which I, I, you can take issue with that, but they could see yields, the 10 year going to 6.5%. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, for sure. Your thoughts. I think it's so fascinating that, that, that populists love tariffs because tariffs are just a tax on the American consumer. So Biden wants to tax rich people and Trump, he won't say it, but all he wants to do is, is, uh, is tax all the people who are importing these cheap things from China and everywhere else. Um, I'll just say, I, mean, I, I still work with some companies uh, on a daily basis and thinking about their supply chains, and it's a material thing for them. Because if you look at where a lot of intermediate parts and things come from, it is still China. There hasn't been any meaningful decoupling. Uh, if uh, I know a couple months ago, the narrative was, oh, look, Mexico has surpassed uh, China as the top U.S. trade partner. It's just because the stuff is coming from China through Mexico, not because there's been actually meaningful change in the global trading system. And the thing about Trump is if it's that 60% on China, 10% on every, and it might not be, but if it is that, you're talking about truly upending the global trading system and a shock for a lot of these companies that are thinking exactly as Marco's thinking. He's not going to do it. There's no way in hell. And the one thing that I will sort of put in your minds that might be different about this time with Trump is remember before COVID, we were all talking about the phase one trade deal. It was supposed to be the cherry on top of the Trump Sunday where I cowed China into submission and they had to buy all these uh, American agricultural goods and commodities and things like this. And this is the beginning of America taking back its future. China didn't live up to any of its commitments in the phase one trade deal. And we know that Trump is very vengeful and doesn't like when he's made to look bad. And he sort of looks bad. If you talk to American farmers or talk to folks who were expecting good things out of the phase one trade deal, they didn't see any of it. And so part of me worries that the place that Trump is coming from is not economic populism. I don't think he's thinking about the median vote or anything like that. I think he thinks that China embarrassed him and he would like a little bit of revenge and he'd like to shove some of that chocolate cake that he had with uh, with Xi Jinping at Mar-a-Lago in 2016, 2017 down Xi Jinping's throat. So I agree with Marco that his scenario is probably more likely than mine. Uh, and great. I hope that's the one that comes true. But I think like the actual tariff scenario is a little scarier, Marco, than you're letting on. And no, it's the I, one that we have to be I'm most prepared for. Yeah, I massively disagree with that just for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you look at the chart on the left, like tariffs, schmerifs, you know, you need a magnifying glass to see that, <laughs> you know, so that's number one. Number two issue is that like, I mean, look, Trump has literally said he's OK with TikTok. Uh, he doesn't want to help the other ones. He he was he stood in front of a crowd in Ohio saying to them, I'm going to bring Chinese EVs to build factories here. He's looking at the 1980s Japanese solution. So, but look, even if that happens, the scenario I'm painting is actually worse. You know, what's happening in the US 
is that long-term inflation expectations are well anchored because of this credibility that the Fed has. Gold prices relative to real yields are telling you that a lot of investors don't buy those long-term inflation expectations. And if you get a Trump or even a Joe Biden presidency with a unified Congress, but that's not going to really happen, you get Trump with unified Congress, that is really kind of the nightmare scenario for markets. And not because of Trump, but because he will have no constraints domestically. And we saw yeah, there's a reason U.S. The, the market likes gridlock. That used to be the tradition. I don't know. I don't know that they don't like anything getting done, but they like checks and balances. Well, also, look, we had a preview. You know, when Liz Truss submitted a uh, budget full of tax cuts that were not paid for, you literally had a market riot in the United Kingdom that forced the BOE to effectively use the yield curve control. And so. You know, that's why I say tariffs, tariffs. Like, yeah, I'm sure that you work with some, you know, companies that deal with this. Like, you can work with some farmers, you can work with some supply chain. For sure, it's important. But on a macro level, if we're talking about a 10-year yield going to 6.5%, I mean, who cares about individual companies? Like, everything is going down. We're not talking 20, 30. We're talking 40, 50% in the is stock market. Is there a market. risk under Biden that the bond market riots as well? I mean, is this I think, a singular Trump risk or is it a, a Biden risk as in, well, as well? We still have them forgiving loans. And, you know, you certainly will will hear from people that they don't think that you know, that everyone's spending like a drunken sailor. It just depends on where and what your preference is. But is that a risk, Marco, that that happens as well, even under a Biden win? Well, you asked earlier, Maggie, is there anyone talking about fiscal consolidation? And yes, Republicans in Congress will be talking about fiscal consolidation when, when Biden wins the re-election. Right. So that's why, no, there isn't a risk of a massive repricing. Because you won't payment. have the ability to do it because they won't, Congress won't give it to them. There'll be a check on it. That's right. And, and by the way, uh, Jacob's view is actually the consensus view in that when you go and you talk to hedge funds, um, very sophisticated hedge funds, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, they all want to talk to you about the trade policy of Donald Trump. They, you know, they're not... Like bond market riots in November 6th, what are you talking about? Um, that's the answer I get. It's mostly like what has happened to the dollar because of the tariffs, what happens to inflation. Um, I just think that that's like something we can worry about in January, February, March, you know, April 2025. I think that on November 6th, if you get unified Congress and Trump, forget about tariffs. The number one issue will be does the market really want more tax cuts? Does it want more pro growth policies? And I think the answer is. Definitively, no, because the 10-year yield is at 4.6. I, I just want to jump in and say, Marco, it's, it's refreshing to be called the consensus because I am so often the contrarian that I'm happy to be ascribed another C word. This is rare for me, and I'm really enjoying it. I agree with you in this one area that um, tariffs are a symptom, not a cause. And if you go back and look at Smoot-Hawley, or if you go back and look at the tariff of abominations from the 1820s and 1830s, which is fascinating history, I won't like spend the whole time talking about it right now. In the 1820s, 1830s, the tariffs actually lead to growth because the United States is at that uh, sort of industrializing phase in its economic life. And it's a good thing. When you look to the 1930s, you know, I think the, the, the narrative is, oh, that Smoot-Hawley helped cause the Great Depression. The Great Depression was already there. Smoot-Hawley and the protectionism and the trade that was coming after it was a symptom of something that was wrong. And that's why I'm saying I, I don't want to spend too much time necessarily on the, Trump, uh, the tariffs. I think a Trump level of tariffs, I think it would be a shock to the system. And I think it would surprise a lot of the physical economy in meaningful ways. But I think the bigger thing here is that trade maybe is starting to change a little bit. And that this talk of tariffs and protectionism is a symptom of something else that's going on. I just go back to what I said before about globalization and China and Mexico. We haven't decoupled or deglobalized at all. There hasn't been a lot of meaningful changing of supply chains. All this lip service that people have paid since 2016, there haven't actually been that many changes. And I take your point that we get, and I took this from you originally, if you start getting higher rates, and you get companies that are not going to do the capex to actually do sort of the deglobalization dance that we're talking about. Then we're off to the races with inflation, and then that super inflation that we talked about is absolutely a scenario that's on the card. So I just want to say I agree with you that tariffs are a symptom, not a cause. But I wouldn't dismiss the symptom because I do think it tells us that maybe there is a disease. It's not necessarily going to be there, but there's a disease that is latent there. That the type of shock that a 60% tariff on every single thing coming into the United States from China, including maybe 60% on stuff that's coming through Mexico or some of these other places, I think that shock might do a little more damage to a patient that is not maybe as healthy as everybody thinks he is on the surface. So, 
Yeah. I, I, a question that may seem out of left field, but I want to raise it because I think that, you know, we're talking about the entire globe and competitiveness and inflation. George asked um, this earlier, Mark, and we didn't get to it. Any comment on the demolition of the yen and what that means? Japan was just, the, the prime minister was just at a state uh, dinner at the White House. And we know there's an alliance with China that people are wondering if they're going to join um, it, between the UK, US and Australia. Any thoughts on what's happening with Japan and how they plug into this? I'm super bullish Japan for all sorts of reasons. I think too many uh, institutional investors, professional investors, uh, they focus on the central bank policy of Japan way too much. And so they're surprised that they didn't normalize their monetary policy. Um, and that's part of the weakness of the yen. And I think there's no inflation in Japan. It's, it's purely a product of currency. Demand in Japan has not recovered to pre-COVID uh, pre levels. It's the only major economy that hasn't actually seen demand go back. So there's no organic inflation in Japan. People keep citing CPI figures, but they don't understand. They're simply looking at inflation that's imported by a currency. And so, that, so that's why I agree with the BOJ decision to keep delaying normalization. And when they adjusted their yield curve control, it was very minor, you know? Um, that's one of the we that's what's weighing on the yen. But um, I think the other thing that's weighing on the yen is the data out of China continues to be very weak. So in March, we actually had complete collapse in total social financing, uh, complete uh, collapse in uh, uptick in, in banking loans. And that's another thing that's uh, a problem. But overall, Japan definitely fits into this whole um, rejigging of supply chain story. Uh, it's a much more likely place for advanced economies to put some of the uh, manufacturing chains than the US. Mm -hmm. I mean, TSMC has already told us they're struggling to get enough labor for the uh, plant in Arizona. Japan is sort of a, a midway. It's an alternative to the US and they of course have the manufacturing know-how. So I'm bullish in Japan in the long term. And I think a lot of institutional investors are starting to think about raising their allocation to Japan in their strategic asset allocation. I'm I'm bullish, maybe for for slightly different reasons. And there's a, like on the long term, I think Marco and I will vigorously agree with each other about Japan as an opportunity. Um, Japan wants a certain type of inflation, and it's been starting to get a little bit of it. If you look at the wage negotiations for the largest labor unions in Japan for this year, you got meaningful wage hikes that were above the rate of inflation. That's something that Japan wants, has been seeking. Let's see if they can continue it and get into that virtuous cycle. What they absolutely don't want is inflation for all the things that they have to import. So they don't want oil to go to the moon. They don't want to have to pay more for all of these other things. And I, I also agree with Marco that I, I think Japan is really badly and poorly understood in Western markets. I actually find China much easier to understand because there's much more data and much more out there about what China is thinking. And if you go and actually listen to the Bank of Japan and all these other things, they're talking about intervening with the yen. So for me, it's just a question of what level is it going to be at? So, I mean, our money's where our mouth is on this. We think the yen might actually strengthen against the dollar. If you look at all of the short interest on the yen right now, I think that's an interesting risk reward. I don't know what number the, they're going to intervene on with the yen, but it will, and they'll move forward and it'll be fine. And I think Marco's point about the exposure to China, that's really the key thing for Japan because, mm -hmm. you know, Kushida's doing the state dinner and he's having dinner with Marcos Jr. and talking about, you know, advanced operations in the South China Sea and building ships with the United United States. And at the same time, Japan needs to be able to export into China. Its companies are building supply chains that will only service China and then supply chains that will service everywhere else in the world. Um, the last thing I'll just say there is Japan is generally more comfortable um, with amb ambiguity in foreign policy. So US foreign policy is very black and white. You're with us, you're against us, axis of evil, blah, blah, blah. Japan has much more of sort of a history of, sure, our biggest trading partner and most important economic partner can be our biggest national security threat. What's the problem with that? Smile and go like have a drink or something like that. So two that's, truths can that's be, the needle they're trying to thread. We can hold two truths at the same time. So we um, we covered a lot of ground and we went a little bit longer because I think it was really important to set the stage. And we are going to have these conversations on the regular as we lead up, as we see these brush fires everywhere, Marco, as you put it. And I think a lot of people like that analogy. And we, we get closer to the election. Um, and I love that you both talked about the opportunities you see, because that's what we're all doing, right? We're trying to find those opportunities. We're trying to sort of have it make sense. Um, let's end on what the greatest risk is. I think we identified that there's concern about the bond market, about, about a riot, uh, bond vigilantes, call them what you want, but the bond market, but rates going up regardless of what the desire is, you know, politically, and, and the Fed and the U.S. administration losing control of the bond market. 
What else for both of you weighs on you and are you watching closely and maybe underappreciated? Marco? No, I mean, I actually think it is the bottom market. I think the biggest risk to this equity rally right now is growth uh, and like more growth, like more robust U.S. economy Stronger is the growth. Mo- right. Yeah, I mean, if the U.S. consumer doesn't start slowing down a little bit and if CapEx and some of the fiscal stuff doesn't fall down, I mean, the bond market will be at 5% before you can blink an eye. And that's a problem. Um, I don't think any geopolitical issue is really as relevant as that is. I mean, think about today. <laughs> you know, I, I look at the, the headlines and it's like, oh, bond yields and Middle East violence weighs the stocks. Like, no, 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 no. That literally makes no sense. If the Middle East violence mattered, bonds would have, uh, would have rallied. Um, so the fact that bonds are selling off and that oil hasn't risen, tells you that nobody's paying attention to the Middle East. I mean, kind of incorrectly in some way. And it's really just that everyone's focused on the U.S. economy, which is completely and utterly um, uncorrelated with like what the Fed is doing, which is whistling uh, in the dark and saying, no, nah, we'll cut. And that's what's causing stocks to go down. This, you know, market, basically investors are betting that the Fed is going to have to pivot away from its dovishness. Mm-hmm. It's going to be tough to do the closer we get to the election, whether you think they're political or not. They just, you know, even if you think they just don't want to be involved in the election, they tend not to want to do stuff as we get, you know, try to get out of the the limelight and the spotlight. Jacob, what about you? What is a risk you're worried about? Well, I'll say that, I mean, we've been worried about the bond market since the beginning of last year, and we've avoided duration and continue to avoid duration of all our of our investment strategies. So like from that point of view, I agree with Marco. Um, I'll also warn you that uh, on my podcast a couple of weeks ago, I was actually talking with my my business partner, Rob, about what we thought the biggest black swan risks were. And he said, oh, uh, you know, a black swan is something you can't even imagine. It would have to be like an earthquake in Manhattan. And lo and behold, the day <laughs> after we published that podcast, there was an earthquake in Manhattan. So be careful because I'm in New might Jersey, post- technically. Wait, yeah, Wait did you guys knock on wood? What are you guys no, doing? No, I'm sorry. But you guys I'm caused sorry. it. Oh. I know. So so what I'm about to say is uh, I'm here in Louisiana. I'm in the Gulf. We had no storms last year. Not only do we have no storms, there was a drought down here. There were wildfires in the swamps. Just like think about that image in your mind for a second. If you look at Colorado State and you look at sort of the projections for what the hurricane season looks like this year, you, you sort of take into account what temperatures are like. Um, a fastly fading El Nino, like I'm worried about a sort of Hurricane Harvey type scenario where maybe for a couple of weeks, if there's a storm, like you knock out some part of the U.S. petrochem or energy complex or something like that. So I, I think Marco's right. Like it's it's the election and it's the bond market. Like that's the stuff that's obvious. But the stuff that keeps me up at night is, OK, like what, what if we actually get a reversion to the mean when it comes to storms hitting the United States? What does that mean for U.S. insurance markets because they've already been battered? Or what does it mean for energy prices, which have stayed honestly relatively muted, even with all of this geopolitical risk around us everywhere. So that, that's my black swan. And I, I hope I didn't just speak it into being. Yeah, we, we hope so too. A perfect storm all around from brush, brush fires to, to uh, the threat of hurricanes. Um, guys, amazing conversation. We didn't even get to spend time on China, but by design now, because that, that just is a whole show in, it, in and of itself, but very complicated a world we're looking at and certainly with huge impact for markets. So we appreciate both of you coming on and sharing all your wisdom with us. And we'll do it on the regular as we lead up to these really important events coming up. So thank you both. Thank you. Th- thanks to it, it, thanks to all of it, you guys for the great questions. Um, like I said, we're going to keep it going. Uh, so if you have thoughts, questions, concerns, post them in the comment section. We'll keep a running tab on them and get them in front of as many people as you can. We've got a festival of learning coming up because we all got to keep trying to make money while we deal with all these big thoughts. Um, That is going to be next week, uh, 18th, 19th. You can register. Brian will drop a link. Uh, All different things you need to think about in terms of digital assets and how they should fit in and whether they're right for you. Um, They're going to cover it all. So it'll be really great stuff. So check that out. In the meantime, everybody take care and good luck out there.